When Trevor arrives to the seventh grade, his social studies teacher begins class with this question. And it's the question I want to engage this morning. So take a look at the clip. Good question, isn't it? So do you know what creates and sustains a broken world? It's usually people who don't know who they are. The founder and author of Storyline, Donald Miller, he says the most dangerous person in the world is a person who does not understand how powerful God made them to be. These people recklessly destroy because they think they are invisible and they don't matter. Now on the flip side, do you know what creates healing and wholeness in a broken world? It is usually, in my experience and observation, it is usually people who know who they are and then they start reminding other people who they are. And these are the things that make for healing. So, who are you and what does the world mean to you? And we have to engage the first question in order to get to that second question because the first question often determines how you respond to the second. Who are you and what does the world mean to you? So after the teacher asks them what does the world mean to you, he then gives them this year-long project that they're able to uh, try to do. And the project is come up with this idea that will change the world and put this idea into action. So the 11-year-old boy, Trevor, actually believes that the world can and should be different. And so he takes his project very seriously. And like he goes out into the world and just starts reminding different people who they are. Now, why would an 11-year-old boy long for the world to be different? Because Trevor, at the age of 11, has already experienced pain and suffering and brokenness. Trevor comes from a troubled home. His mom is a recovering alcoholic but still has a few good relapses left in her. His dad is for the most part absent, but he's kind of in and out of the picture. In fact, when he's out of the picture, it's better for Trevor because then Trevor doesn't have to watch this guy hit his mom. And every day that Trevor goes to school, he sees this group of kids bullying and teasing and picking on his friend Adam. Trevor knows pain and brokenness and suffering. And Trevor believes the world can be different. And so Trevor concocts this system that we know is pay it forward. And he, his idea is to go to three different people and show them incredible generosity, acts of kindness and compassion. And then these three people will then go to three people. And those three people go to three people. And this thing just kind of turns into a movement and spreads. But when you're watching the movie, early on you can't help but think to yourself, come on now, this is just a bit too simplistic, like overly simplistic. At any rate, Trevor actually believes in love and kindness and compassion. So what does he do? He starts with this homeless junkie on the streets who's addicted to the needle. And Trevor takes him in without his mom knowing. He, there's a scene where he's sharing a bowl of cereal with this man. And he even lets him stay in the garage one night, again, without his mom knowing. And he gives him clean clothes so that he can hopefully get a job. And Trevor starts reminding another project of his is his mom because he believes in his mom. He believes that her story doesn't have to be the way it is now. So he starts reminding her who she is. Like, mom, you don't have to live this way. You don't deserve a man in your life who's going to hit you. You deserve better than this. You deserve people who are going to surround you and be for you and be for you to thrive and, and all of these good things. And this movement of generosity explodes. It reaches a felon in prison. It reaches a, news, uh, a newscaster in L.A. 
It extends to the old, to the young, to the rich, and to the poor. It extends to everyone. And you essentially have all these people going around reminding one another who they are. So, ultimately, this film, I think most of you have seen it, according to the hands. So I'm just going to give a spoiler alert to some of you. Trevor believes that good will overcome evil. This film and film studies is a very typical Christ film, meaning the main character gives up his or her life to save marginalized peoples. So think of this movie. Trevor gives up his life for who? Adam. Remember your Genesis stories. What does Adam translate into humanity? What is a filmmaker doing here? Filmmakers are working on all sorts of levels to get you to think of issues in ways you've never thought about them. So think of the movie Trevor is tired of seeing Adam being bullied. So Trevor steps into the middle of this bully scene. How does Trevor die? He's pierced in his side. Can you think of anyone else who was pierced in their side as they're dying for humanity? And it just so happens that when the camera starts, when the lens starts coming out, Trevor dies on the concrete. And what does he die on? One of the cracks in the concrete. And this crack just so happens to make the form of a cross. And by the way, where does the setting of this movie take place? Anyone remember? Las Vegas, baby. Sin City. What's the filmmaker doing? Telling the story in such a way to get us, the moviegoer, to think of the human condition and what might save humanity here. What might be the rescuing factor? So Trevor starts with this incredibly simple question. How can I go out into a broken world and show love, kindness, and compassion? And when I do, will any of it make a difference. So I want to turn to a story in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Samuel. We were in the book of 2 Samuel a couple of weeks ago, and we're going back. We're going back to chapter 9. If you haven't read 2 Samuel lately, it will make for an enjoyable couple of hours. If you like Game of Thrones, you will like 2 Samuel. There's lots and lots of action here. So the back story, we're going to talk about David and uh, Meph- Mephibosheth, that's how you say his name, Mephibosheth. And here's the backstory to David and Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel, David is not yet king. In fact, we're told the first king of Israel comes in 2 Samuel. His name is Saul, and Saul has three sons. One of those sons, his name is Jonathan. David is this up-and-coming star, and David and Jonathan become Really, really, really close friends. In fact, early on, David says to Jonathan, Hey, Jonathan, your love for me is better than that of a woman. And he goes on to say, Jonathan, if anything happens to you, just like keep in mind, just know this, I am going to look out for your family. And indeed, on that day, something did happen to Jonathan. You see, Israel was in this major, long, drawn-out battle with the Philistines. It was really complex. And there was this battle in Gilboa. And Saul and all of his three sons were killed in this battle. Their lives were taken. Here's the kicker in the story. Jonathan, Saul's son, Jonathan has a five-year-old son one of Jonathan's servants has heard what had just happened on the battlefield, that Saul and his three sons, including Jonathan, were killed. And so his servants, one of the servants, runs to Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, who's five years old, 
and she picks him up in her arms because she knows that this five-year-old is a threat to those in power because the new king is going to want to do away with Mephibosheth because he is next in line. So she picks him up and she begins to run with him. And when she's running, she accidentally trips and falls and drops Mephibosheth, five years old, and both of his feet are broken. The break is so bad that the text tells us his feet are permanently injured. They are never the same. At any rate, the servant picks him back up and starts running to this place of safety because she knows they're going to be after him. And she takes him to this land called Lo Debar. Two important things for you to know. Mephibosheth translates as dispeller of shame. And it's a really fun name to say, Mephibosheth. If you are pregnant and it's a baby boy and you don't have a name picked out yet, <laughs> you could always go with Mephibosheth. Now, Remember, storytellers are like good filmmakers. They're doing things on different levels. They're telling the story in such a way to expand human consciousness, to get us, the audience, to come alive to things in brand new ways. So where is Mephibosheth spending the rest of his days? In the land of Lodabar, which translates as nothing, or the land without pasture, land without fields, the land of nothingness. Keep those two things in mind as we read this story of David and Meph Mephibosheth. <laughs> David is now king at this point, by the way. Saul has died. David is the new king. So David asks, is there anyone from Saul's family still alive that I could show faithful love for Jonathan's sake? Are you Ziba, the king asked? At your service, he answered. There was a servant from Saul's household named Ziba. And he was summoned before David the king, and he was summoned before David. The king asked, is there anyone left from Saul's family that I could show? Did I just read that? I didn't go forward. Man, I'm all sorts of, where is he? King, okay, let's start over. Yes, Ziba said to the king, one of Jonathan's sons whose feet are crippled. Where is he? The king asked. He is at the house of Amiel, son of Machir, at Lodabar, Ziba told the king. So King David had him brought from the house of Amiel, son of Machir, at Lodabar. Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson, came to David and he fell to the ground, bowing low out of respect. Mephibosheth, David said. Yes, he replied, I am at your service. Don't be afraid, David told him, because I will certainly show you faithful love for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the fields, keep in mind he's living in Lodabar, all the fields of your grandfather Saul, and you will eat at my table always. Mephibosheth bowed low out of respect and said, Who am I, your servant, that you should care about a dead dog like me? Then David summoned Saul's servant, Ziba, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything belonging to Saul and his family. You will work the land for him. You, your sons and your servants, you will bring food into your master's house for them to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will always be at my table. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my master the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. All who lived in Ziba's household became Mephibosheth's servants. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was crippled in both feet. That is a tongue twister of a story to read. So a couple of observations about this story. First, when you read it, it seems that what King David is doing here is overly simplistic, doesn't it? He just walks into someone's house and says, hey, is there anyone here that I could show God's compassion to? Like, that's really simple. 
Now, imagine if you are Mephibosheth. You have been spending the last several years, since you could remember, you have been spending your days in low debar and nothingness. And you are a complete nobody because your feet don't exactly work. And in that time, in that day, in that culture, you were of use to no one. You couldn't go to battle. You couldn't contribute to society. So you were pushed off to the margins. He's living in Lodabar, even though his name is Mephibosheth, the dispeller of shame. Mephibosheth's greatest fear is that one day he'll wake up and look out his window and he'll see soldiers coming after him because even after all these years, he's still seen as a threat. And on this particular morning, he wakes up and he looks out the window and indeed his greatest fear comes true. The king is coming after him. And Mephibosheth is sure that this is his last moment. These are his final breaths. The, the king has come for his head. And so Mephibosheth starts bowing out of fear and respect. And, and the king says, David says, Mephibosheth, that, don't be afraid. That's not why I've come. And then king, king David says to him, in fact, I need, I need you to come back to my home. And so they go on this journey back to his house. And King David leads them into the dining room. And in the dining room, there's this huge table. And there's a spot open at this table. And David looks at Mephibosheth and says, Mephibosheth, here's what you need to know. All I have is yours. But see, Mephibosheth, he doesn't know who he is because he's been living for years in his own shame, being a nobody, even though he's the dispeller of shame. He's been living not knowing who he is, so he responds, King, what would you want with a dead dog like me? And the king responds to him, no, 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 no. This is not who you are. Your life matters. You have value. Mephibosheth, look at this table. All I have is yours. How many times have you played the role of Mephibosheth? Let's be honest. We all have a little bit of Mephibosheth in us, don't we? Like something happens along the way, something happens in your story, and it causes you to live in some sort of shame, and you forget who you are. You start to question yourself on every level. And because you don't know who you are, you really don't think very highly of the world around you. And in fact, when it comes to the world, you have by and large given up. We were in our storyline group on Thursday night. And someone was brave and vulnerable enough as they're sharing their stories, their negative turns, to tell us that she had had some really negative experiences in her childhood when it came to being alone. And we were talking about what it might look like for her to redeem this negative turn. And so we started asking her a few questions. Well, do, do you like now have a heart for those who are lonely and, and do you go to them? And it was so funny to watch her kind of light up. And she says, oh yeah, that, that is me. That's like my thing. I love going to people who are lonely because I know what that feels like and I don't want them to go through that. So like I have an eye for that. I have a heart for these people. And people in the room started saying, as we're sitting around the living room, well, isn't that like who you are? And isn't this the redemption in it? Now you look out for others? Maybe that's what it means to pay it forward. That we take that brokenness, we take that pain, we take that suffering, and because we know what that feels like, we say, I don't want others to go through that. I don't want others to feel this. 
And so we go to them. Have you experienced the kind of grace and redemption that allows you to rethink that question? What does the world mean to you? And the project seems overly simplistic. Is there anyone here I can show love and compassion to? But take heart, my friends, because when we start redeeming that pain and the brokenness and suffering and we start reaching out to people, those acts of kindness and those acts of compassion can bring the deepest, deepest kinds of healing and transformation. So the last scene in the movie, <clears throat> it is of uh, Trevor's mom and his grandma. And something tells me that Trevor's mom experienced God in the story that she heard God saying, all I have is yours. You don't have to live this way. She was so moved by Trevor's movement that she decides to pay it forward. Her mom, too, is living as an alcoholic on the streets. She has given her life away to this. And Trevor's mom wants it to be different for her mom. Trevor's grandma, this is Trevor's grandma. He hasn't been, she hasn't been to one of Trevor's birthday parties in years. She's been absent for years. But Trevor's mom decides to pay it forward. And paying it forward comes in all sorts of different forms. So take a look at this scene. <clears throat> 